Anyway, okay, so what was I just demonstrating? I was demonstrating a community. So welcome to our second part of our overview of ecology lecture. And you'll remember that a community is a group of interacting species. And so how these species interact and affect each other and how they interact um, and affect and are affected by their non-living environment. So we're so again, a community is a set of species living in one place at one time, potentially affecting each other and their non-living environment. So this is uh, the second part of the lecture is community ecology. And so community ecology is a fascinating topic and it's very much based on theories that themselves are based in economics and, and uh, other mathematical theories. Um, so you take the principles of exponential and logistic population growth that you learned already and now we're going to apply that to what happens when different species compete with each other for resources. So let's start off talking about food pyramids and that is if you go out in, into nature you're going to see different species eating different things so for example maybe you have a top predator like this guy eating a rabbit this could be like the the hare and the I don't know maybe this is a tiger but the top predator is eating this guy but maybe this guy ate that guy maybe this guy ate plants so the idea is that every set of species has its own level in a pyramid depending on what it eats and so each level of eating is called a trophic level and ultimately um, all energy in a food pyramid comes from the producers so the producers are the organisms that are photosynthetic they're autotrophs or self-eaters in the sense that they use energy from the sun to produce sugars and then they use some of those sugars for themselves but whatever eats them is going to Get energy from that whatever eats that thing is going to get energy from that etc and so we say that each trophic level in a food pyramid produces what's called biomass that means if you dried that uh, those organisms at that level out uh, the mass the weight of the dry stuff that's left behind of organic matter is your biomass now the most important concept here is that as you go up each trophic level in a food pyramid you'll lose energy um, and so for example if we look at this picture right here uh, here are this is a marine ecosystem here and what you see here are the producers in this marine ecosystem and these are the phytoplankton so phytoplankton are little itty bitty floating photosynthetic things so some kinds of protists for example and let's say that through harvesting energy from the sun uh, these phytoplankton are able to get out 10,000 um, kilocalories of usable energy so they produce 10,000 kilocalories or what you commonly think of as calories out of the food that they produce from the sun well then come along the primary consumers that's the little critters that eat the phytoplankton and we're going to call these zooplankton they're kind of animal like protists um, and so the zooplankton eat the phytoplankton but because you lose energy in the form of heat at each of these trophic levels you only actually get um, a small percentage of the kilocalories that were available at the producer level so these zooplankton for every 10,000 calories produced by the phyto phytoplankton the primary consumers are only getting out a thousand and as you keep going up that food pyramid heat is lost to the surroundings again and thus you lose energy and so the secondary consumers the things that eat the zooplankton so in this case these might be some kind of fish like perch or depends on what kind of ecosystem you're talking about the idea is that these secondary uh, consumers when they eat the primary consumers they're only getting out a hundred kilocalories for every thousand calories available with uh, from the primary consumers which um, is a lot less than the original 10,000 that was available from the phytoplankton and finally you get to a top predator a top predator or in many cases us being the top predator and if we ate the secondary consumers we're only getting out 10 calories for every 10,000 that was created by those those producers the phytoplankton so in other words it's kind of ecologically inefficient to be a top predator right that's right because being a top predator means you're going to have to hunt a lot more. You're, you're getting very little energy um, as you move up the food chain. 
um, and that's because you've lost this energy in the form of heat. And so um, you usually never see more than four or five links in this uh, food pyramid, four or five trophic levels in this food pyramid, because it's inefficient to go any higher than that. If, if anything ate this human, they'd basically be getting zero calories for every 10,000 calories that were created by the phytoplankton. So um, this is what we call ecological efficiency. You're losing energy as you move up, move up the food chain, as you move up the food pyramid. And so it's uh, ecologically inefficient to be anything higher than a fourth or fifth level top predator. Um, now, of course, these decomposers are also um, affected by this. So things like bacteria, fungi, things that are decomposing dead and decaying organisms you're going to be a much more efficient decomposer if you're decomposing things like phytoplankton and primary consumers than you would be if you were consuming secondary consumers or tertiary consumers. Makes sense, right? So who's more efficient here, the bunny or the cat? Bunny wins, yay. Okay, so that is what we call a food pyramid. It's kind of a, a diagram of a linear progression of energy as you go, uh, as you go to higher and higher trophic levels. More realistic of what really happens in nature is what we call a food web. So a food web, um, this is kind of what we were talking about when we were talking about those dominoes, that all organisms within an ecosystem are all connected to each other. And let's say, for example, let's say that species one here, this rabbit, and species two, this rabbit, these are two different species of rabbits, let's say they both like to eat this little yellow dinosaur here. Well, there's two ways they could compete with each other. They could compete directly by attacking each other or fighting each other or whatever, but they can also affect each other indirectly because they're competing for the same resource, in this case, the dinosaur. So this guy is trying to get to the dinosaur. This guy is trying to get to the dinosaur. And so if this guy's very successful at eating all the dinosaurs, this guy's going to be affected and he's going to die because he can't get food, right? And if this guy dies, well, the top predators just lost some of his food, so eh, he's not doing so well either. So anyway, the idea is that everything is connected, and sometimes you don't know what those indirect interactions are. So for example, here's um, a simple diagram of a common food web um, that's found off the rocky coast, the rocky intertidal zone um, off the coast of places like Santa Barbara or up in, in Washington State. And uh, what we have here, this guy's name is is Robert Payne, very famous ecologist, and he worked for many, many decades, still does, uh, on the Rocky Intertidal Zone off the coast of Washington. And he noticed that um, a lot of the starfish populations, the sea stars, were going down because, you know, people, tourists like to go and take the starfish and because they're cool to have in your collection. And, and uh, he was noticing that removing that top predator, that starfish, actually had negative effects on the whole food web. And so he actually st set up some really simple yet elegant studies where he had control populations and experimental populations. And in the experimental populations, he removed the top predator, the starfish. So um, this is uh, the starfish is of the genus Pisaster. And it turns out that this guy is the regulator. He's the top predator of this whole food web. So he likes to go along and eat things like limpets, which are these little mollusks they have kind of a shell and a soft body um, and they they sit on the rocks and and he also eats barnacles and so you see these arrows here and the arrows point from the prey to the predator so you can see that the starfish eats limpets he eats barnacles he eats snails and he eats chitons and chitons are these little another kind of mollusk that has like it's kind of like a roly-poly how he rolls up um, and then right here in the middle is something that the starfish do not eat. This is mytilus, mussels. So the mussels eat the chitons, um, and the mussels eat the barnacles, but the starfish also eat the chitons and the barnacles. So what does this mean? This means that under normal conditions, the mussels and the starfish are actually in indirect competition for each other, with each other because they're both after the same limited resource here. So these guys are all found on rocks. And so in this case, often the limiting resource is not just food, it's also space on a rock. Well, what Robert Payne did in the experimental treatments, he said, let's go ahead and get rid of the star. I'm going to 
cross out the starfish. Bleep, 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 bleep. Okay, starfish is gone. This represents what's happening when people take starfish. So now, so now these limpets suddenly don't have their top predator. And if they don't have their top predator, their population can grow like crazy because there's nobody eating them. So now their population grows exponentially and boom, 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 you have tons of limpets. So I'm going to write that a little arrow to show that their population suddenly increases. Well, the problem is here, while the limpet population is now increasing because we got rid of the top predator, here are your barnacles. Now the barnacles also could grow because they didn't have their predator anymore, but they also were in competition with the limpets. These guys were both in competition for space on the rock. And so when the limpet population started to increase, this guy now has less space on the rock for himself, and so his population will ultimately decrease. So it might have increased a little at the beginning because he didn't have his predator, but the limpets also didn't have their predator. So now the fact that the limpets are exploding, this guy's gonna, population is going to go down. Well, now you say, okay, now the barnacles are crashing. Well, this muscle here depends on those barnacles for food. So now he has less food, which means his population goes down. Okay, well, if his population goes down, now this guy, the chitons, they're like, woohoo, I don't have my starfish predator, and now I don't have as much of my mussel predator, so my population's going to, boom, really grow, go crazy and grow exponentially. So his population goes up, but now the snails say, okay, I don't have my predator, good, but now these chitons, who I'm competing with for space on the rock, and these limpets, who I'm competing against for space on the rock, are going crazy. So my population goes down. Okay, so now we're losing our snails and we're losing our barnacles and we're losing our mussels. So now we got limpets and chitons competing with each other, but they're also competing with themselves. So they're doing what's called intraspecific competition, where they're competing with themselves, as well as interspecific competition, where they're competing with another species. And so initially, while their populations explode, we already saw what happens when populations overshoot their carrying capacity. What, that's right, they either come back to their carrying capacity or they boom, 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 crash to extinction. And so the net effect, the long-term effect of getting rid of this top predator here is ultimately overall lowered biodiversity, an entire crash of an entire food web. Really bad stuff. So that is called the keystone predator effect, where you... You take away that top predator and everything else, it's like dominoes. Everything else collapses and you lose entire biodiversity of your ecosystem. This happens all the time in nature. Uh, we see this with wolves in Yellowstone National Park. We've seen it with otters and kelp beds. We're seeing it in marine ecosystems with loss of, of top predator sharks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is a worldwide phenomenon and it's probably one of the larger threats to biodiversity and often the loss of the top predator is due to human activities. So uh, just remember, it's all about dominoes. It's the domino effect. All the indirect actions that um, and indirect interactions of organisms that may not be intuitively obvious when you first look at a system. So let's get into a little more nitty gritty of these species interactions. How species interact with each other and it's fascinating and community ecologists are so interested in studying these interactions and seeing if we can model them mathematically and look at them experimentally in the field and in the lab it's lots of fun so here's where it gets a little confusing and this is why i brought along uh, two species of bunny rabbits here i hope my baby doesn't mind that i'm borrowing her toys but anyway we're going to look at the different kinds of interactions that different species can have with each other within a community. And so we're going to look at the effects of species one, we'll call that Peter Rabbit over here, and um, the effects dealing with species two. So we're going to look at the effects of species one on species two. So um, these are the different kinds of species interactions. So the first one is the one we've already been talking about, bum, 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 competition. And again, that competition can be direct bow, 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 or indirect. Okay. Now, ultimately, if you walked outside and you looked at nature, you looked at the trees, you looked at uh, marine ecosystems, land ecosystems, 
Think about this. What you're really looking at is the result of past interactions. And many of those interactions are what we call competition. So imagine that you see a line of a certain species of pine tree out there. The pine trees might be there because they were the winners of some competitive interactions perhaps thousands to millions of years ago. So the idea is that competition ultimately results in the distribution of species. However, in the process of competition, and the idea is that competition happens when two species are competing with each other, either directly or indirectly, over a shared limited resource. So in this case, the dinosaur. Okay, so if, um, now ultimately one species might outcompete the other one, so he goes extinct and he survives, but both are negatively affected by that competitive interaction. So even if he prevails and he gets the dinosaurs all to himself, he's still taken a hit by having to spend energy and other resources to acquire what this guy also wanted. So we can list this as saying the effect of species one on species two and vice versa, it's negative negative. They're both negatively affected by that interaction of competition. Now you could think of another case where one species is harmed, so we show that with a negative sign, so ouch, right? And the other species is neutral, and we put that with a with a zero here. So harmed, but neutral. Duh, 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 don't know what I'm doing. Okay, so that we call that type type of interaction where one species is harmed and the other is neutral. That's called amensalism. And uh, you can think of an example of amensalism, like um, okay, let's say here's a certain species, this cat, and here's a little baby dinosaur, which is much smaller than him in this make believe community here. And da 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 So what happened there was this species was harmed because it got trampled by this big cat here, but the cat didn't even know he had done that. So that's an amensalistic interaction, that this guy's affected by the presence of this guy, but this guy's not affected at all, either negatively or positively. So that's amensalism. Um, and then there is exploitation interactions. So exploitation is where one species is harmed, but the other benefits. So the other, the obvious example here would be chomp, 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 chomp. Mm, yum. So the idea is that between predators and prey, the prey obviously is harmed. He becomes a meal, but this guy drives energy and a good meal out of his prey. So he benefits, he is harmed, and that is called exploitation. So this is common with predator-prey relationships and parasite-host relationships. You know, in the case of parasites and hosts, like, uh, for example, a bacterial infection, the bacteria are benefiting by eating the host. The host is, is harmed. That would be an exploitation interaction. Um, now, kind of the opposite of amensalism is comensalism. So in a comensalistic uh, interaction, one species is neutral and the other one benefits. So um, a good example of this might be, um, like, have you seen cows and little birds? Pretend this is a bird. And the bird is sitting here. Actually, we'll pretend this is the bird. It's actually an elephant. But, you know, the birds like to hop a ride on the cows as they're going through. So the cow is neutrally affected by the presence of the bird. The bird's not really doing anything. It's not affecting him negatively or positively in any way, but the bird gets to hitch a ride, and so that benefits him. So that would be an example of a comensalism. But my favorite interaction, and the one that they think evolutionarily all interactions will ultimately lead to between two species, is what's called a mutualism. So a mutualism is an interaction where both species benefit from the presence of each other. And I have some cool examples here. So we have cleaner shrimp who will go along and, and uh, clean coral and, and fish and things like that. So they get the meals off of whatever little parasites they're picking off. And the fish or the coral benefits by um, having their parasites removed. And here's a cleaner fish that does the same thing. These guys are a very interesting interaction, aphids and ants. And if you've ever seen the movie A Bug's Life, you remember that the queen ant was like carrying a pet aphid under her under her arm? And that's to make fun of the real mutualistic symbiosis interaction that's happening between these guys. And I found this out the hard way. So aphids produce little um, sweet droplets of what they call honeydew, it's sweet. And we all know that ants like sweet stuff. They have, kind of have a sugar tooth. 
Well, the ants will tend to a crop of aphids. They'll go along and, you know, make sure their area is clean and protect them from predators. Um, and in return, they get the sweet honeydew to eat that the aphids produce, which is really aphid poop, but it's sweet. Um, now, I found this out the hard way one day when I went and I was looking at a plant um, that had these really cool blue aphids on it. I was like, oh, this is so cool. They're sequestering the toxins from the, the plant, and that's making them blue, which is warning their predators that they're toxic. And as I'm touching it, all of a sudden my hand blows up like a balloon because the ants started attacking me because I was threatening their food source. Anyway, mutualism, very, very cool. Okay, so let's get back to competition because you could spend a whole PhD just on studying competition. So as I mentioned, we think it's at the root of all ecological um, interactions. And so competition is differences in the ability of particular species to exploit their resources. And so who wins in a competitive interaction, and you know this whether you're watching football or studying organisms, is that whichever individuals are more efficient at acquiring a resource will ultimately win. And in evolutionary terms, we measure this through evolution, and how we do that is whether or not organisms leave offspring. So those that leave more offspring mean they've gotten more resources, and ultimately they will win. And so they can drive the course of evolution. They drive evolutionary change because they will leave more offspring and therefore pass on more genes. And again, we talked about different ways uh, competition occurs. So obviously these male reindeer are in direct competition with each other. And what do you think that shared resource is that they're in competition over? If you said females, you are correct. So uh, here's some more pictures here. These guys are obviously in direct competition, again, for a female. But these aren't reindeer. These are beetles. Who'd have thunk it, right? So again, I touched on this before, but just to spell it out, uh, two kinds of competition that we have. Intraspecific competition is competition among individuals of the same species. So unfortunately, I don't have two toys that are the same species. But um, if I, as a human, was competing against another human, that would be intraspecific competition. Intra means within, specific, dealing with species. Um, these guys are doing intraspecific competition because they're both stag beetles competing with each other for a female. Um, and so we measure the amount of intraspecific competition that goes on in a population as carrying capacity, K. Because if you think about it, the only thing that limits um, population growth is carrying capacity. And so of two individuals within a species, whichever one has a higher carrying capacity has more potential to grow, and it can usually survive with less resources. Um, and so really, it's the carrying capacity that's regulation, regulating the population size. And so as your population size is increasing, in, as you're adding more individuals, you're exploiting more resources, so your resource level goes down, which means that the potential for competition among individuals is going up within a species. So just if this kind of sounds like a lot of what's going on here, think of this in terms of the human population we already talked about, right? As the human population size increases, there's more strain on the resources. And so we start competing with each other more and more to gain access to those resources. But we're all of the same species, so that's intra-specific competition. Um, now, does this happen in humans? Well, uh, what are a lot of wars over? Ultimately, they think World War III might be over water. Well, water, if it's a shared resource and it's limited, you can bet that individuals within the human species will be competing with each other for it. So, again, intraspecific competition, competition within a species. The opposite of intraspecific competition is in ter-specific competition. So inter means between, between different species. So now I get to use my, my props here. So these guys are different species competing for resources. So that these guys would be competing inter-specifically. Um, and so uh, again, this has negative effects on both species and often it leads to the extinction of a species. Blech. So extinction is the ultimate result of these negative, negative, interspecific comp competitive interactions. Um, so one species will always drive the other species extinct if they're competing for the same resource. So we can ask the question, and in, 
in competitive interactions, interspecific competitive interactions, who will win? And what community ecologists love to do is try to make mathematical model predictions of who will win and figure out, okay, well, it depends. It depends maybe who's larger, who's faster, who start has a larger population size to begin with, who has a more, uh, a greater R, a greater natural ability to produce lots of offspring, uh, who has the higher carrying capacity. So there's all these different variables that can go into a model to predict which species will win. Um, now, if you ever take a, an ecology class, you'll learn all that math, but fortunately for you, I'm not going to teach it in this lecture. So anyway, the idea that if two different species are competing for the same limited resource, one will always drive the other extinct. That's called the competitive exclusion principle. Two species in continued direct competition for one limiting resource cannot coexist. One will always drive the other extinct. So uh, illustrating this graphically, we have this. If this is population size and this is time, and we have here species A and species B, if they're competing for the same resource, eventually one, has, one will drive the other extinct because one will have the higher carrying capacity. So whichever one can survive at a higher carrying capacity will drive the other guy extinct. So that's the competitive exclusion principle. Now what does this mean for evolution? This means that it's in the best interest of two different species to not compete for the same resource. Go find your own niche, dude. So maybe I'll go eat uh, carrots and I will go eat cauliflower. And as long as we're eating different things, we're not in direct competition with each other. And you say, okay, yeah, but we're in competition for the same rabbit holes. Well, why don't you use your rabbit hole during the day and you use your rabbit hole at night? We're therefore in a temporal set of different ecological niches where even though we're using the same resource, we're doing it at different times and therefore we're not in direct competition. So this is what evolution does. It leads to what's called resource partitioning where these guys will use resources differently or at different times or use different resources altogether. And by doing that, they can coexist. And so you can think of something like Darwin's finches or Hawaiian honey creepers on different islands that you, um, you learned this when we talked about evolution, that when organisms colonize an island archipelago, they'll suddenly have this boom, really fast, rapid evolution of different um, niches. So you'll have for example, honey creepers, some of them like to suck honey out of or nectar out of flowers. Others become insect eaters. Um, others become seed crackers and their and their bills, their beaks change shape um, accordingly. And that's they think that's an idea. Um, they think that happens because it's a method of avoiding competition. Because remember, competition, even if one wins, both are still negatively affected. And so if you can use different resources, both species will ultimately um, benefit and be more successful evolutionarily. So the only way to coexist is for each species to use its own independently renewable resource and not be in direct competition or indirect competition for the same resource. Can't we all just get along in, in the animal kingdom? So again, just to recap the different kinds of competition, we had intra and inter-specific competition. And then within that, when you have um, two individuals or two species competing for a resource, they could do it directly, and we call that um, exploitation competition. So um, species can compete for a resource directly, pow, pow, keep you away from it, pow, 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 or they can compete for it indirectly, Zzz, back, both after the same thing at the same time. So if they're competing indirectly, that's called exploitation competition. So here's an illustration of that. Imagine this is the resource, species one da, 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 wants that resource, and species two also wants that resource. And so they're in competition with each other, these two species, but they're doing it indirectly through a shared resource. So that's called exploitation competition. Um, interference competition is bam, 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 bam. That's where they're actually fighting each other directly. And so we can illustrate that right here. So species one and species two, boom, 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 are in direct competition. Now, 
usually you think of this as tooth and claw, right? You think of animals directly competing with each other or like the reindeer you saw with their antlers. But it turns out it's not just animals that do direct competition. Even plants do. How cool is that? Well, I told you about the creosote bushes, right? And how they're putting creosol into the soil to keep other plants away. So that chemical warfare among plants is called allelopathy, like allele in genetics, allelopathy. Pathy means disease. But um, here's another interesting case of a plant that does direct interference competition. Eucalyptus trees, most of you know what a eucalyptus tree is. You know, the koala bears might eat it or you can get the eucalyptal oil and it's in your shampoos and your lotions. Well, it turns out that that eucalyptal oil, that eucalyptus tree is produced by their leaves, and you, you, if you get hold of eucalyptus leaves and you rub them, smell them, it'll smell very medicinal. Um, but they actually use it to coat themselves in a layer of oil. Now, why would they do that? Well, eucalyptus are native to areas which are prone to fires, like forest fires or lightning fires. And so it turns out they want to catch on fire. Like you see this... Uh, eucalyptus tree totally ablaze here and the reason why is if they catch on fire they'll survive because of the they're coated in oil uh, kind of like you know the fire eaters that you see you know they, they can actually engulf fire because they put oil in their mouth so they catch on fire and are unharmed because of the oil they're coated in but meanwhile any seeds from any comp competing species that are in the soil will be burned up so they're kind of using fire and eucalyptal oil to kill off their competitors directly. How cool is that? Okay, so um, sometimes you have organisms that you wouldn't think of as competing with each other. Um, barnacles, 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 barnacles. They're so cool. These guys are animals. I mean, you wouldn't think of a barnacle as being an animal, but it is, and in fact, in its juvenile stage, it floats through the water. Well, it turns out that these guys do uh, directly compete with each other on rocks in the rocky intertidal zone. So just like we were talking about um, Robert Payne's study um, on the rocky intertidal zone with regards to starfish and things like that, um, this guy, another famous ecologist, Joseph Connell, back in the 60s, did a classic field study on the rocky intertidal zone and looking at competition between different species of barnacles. So let's introduce um, our species here. So he studied balanus, which are large barnacles that are very common on rocks in off the coast of Washington, Oregon, California. And also on the same rocks, you'll find little tiny barnacles. And these are of the genus Thamelus. So we have balanus, the big guy, Thamelus, the little guy. But Joseph Connell went out there and he noticed that these guys are found at different heights on the rocks. You usually see Thamelus um, present very high on the rocks and balanus is much lower, and they occur in these bands. So just to illustrate this, so uh, here's the highest tide level. Here's our rock. Here are the little guys, Thamelus. This is their geographic range. And here is balanus, um, and he can exist all the way down to the lowest low tide, but not below that. And so that's the observation, right? And now you want to ask why. Why is Thamelus always in its geographic distribution up here, and Balanus is always in its geographic distribution here and never there? What is causing that difference of location among these two species, between these two species? Well, let's come up with some hypotheses. So hypothesis one, maybe it has to do with competition. Maybe Balanus is keeping Thamelus from growing down there. So he's competitively excluding Thamelus from this range. Okay, that's one hypothesis. Hypothesis two, maybe it has nothing to do with competition. Maybe this little guy just can't tolerate being constantly submerged by the water. He needs, uh, during, you know, where the highest high tide is, when, when you're at low tide, this is exposed to the air. And so these guys, maybe they've evolved to have some drying time and, and can't tolerate being constantly submerged. Or hypo, uh, hypothesis three is the opposite. Maybe Balanus is not competing with Thamelus. It just can't stand drying. And so he has to be submerged under water all the time. Now we could also ask the question, and what is keeping Balanus from going down here if, if hypothesis three is correct? Hmm. Well, what did Connell do to test these hypotheses? Well, classic, simple yet elegant ecological experiments using the scientific method. 
he actually went out in the field and basically did a switcheroo. He had control rocks. He had treatment rocks. Of course, he did the same thing to the control rocks he did to the treatment rocks, except uh, like he would pry barnacles off the rock and then put them back in the same place as a control to control for the effect of manipulating and handling these guys. But in the treatments, here's what he did. He took Thamelus off of Thamelus's spot on the rock and Balanus off of Balanus's spot on the rock and stuck Balanus up where Thamelus was, Thamelus down to where Balanus was, and even took some Balanus and put it down where it doesn't exist below the lowest low tide. Hmm, what do you think happened? And of course he had some rocks where he only moved Thamelus, rocks where he only moved Balanus, etc. So everything was controlled and you're um, encouraged to go and actually look up the study using something like scholar.google.com. You can look at Connell's 1961 studies on this. But he did this to see what would happen. So if hypothesis one was true, that there was competition going on, and you move Balanus up here um, and Thamelus down here, you should see Thamelus couldn't survive down here because Balanus is present, but if you took Balanus away, he'd be able to survive. Um, and if hypothesis two, two is correct, that Thamelus just can't stand being constantly underwater, then it wouldn't matter whether you took Balanus away or not. Uh, Thamelus wouldn't be able to survive. And if hypothesis three was correct, then when you took Thamelus away and put Balanus up at the top, Balanus still couldn't survive because of the drying. And so here's, uh, so he removed Balanus, he took a control, count, uh, his control was, um, to count them and, and not remove them. And uh, anyway, so after he did the switcheroos, he followed the fates of these, mar he marked the individuals and watched them for many, many years. I mean, this was like a 20 year study he was doing. And he'd be out there taking counts of these guys all the time. And lo and behold, what he found was very, very fascinating. So remember hypothesis one um, was that competition was going on. So the question of why can't Thamelus grow in the lower tidal zone where Balanus is? The hypothesis is that Balanus was competitively excluding Thamelus. And in fact, he found that to be supported because it turns out that if you take Balanus away, Thamelus survives just fine in that lower tidal zone where Balanus is. So in other words, the distribution of Thamelus is limited by interspecific competition with Balanus. And the reason why, he, when he looked into this more, it turns out Balanus, being the larger barnacle, grows really, really fast. And as it grows, it either crushes Thamelus or grows under it and pries it off the rock. A barnacle prying another barnacle off of a rock. That is interference competition. That is direct, boom, ouch, kind of competition. So... In the competition for the limited resource being space, Balanus will win. And so Thamelus is competitively excluded from living on the rock when Balanus is present. Okay, but what about this question? Why doesn't Balanus grow in the highest tide zone? So if you took Thamelus away, you still couldn't get Balanus surviving where Thamelus was. And it turns out because of biological properties that Balanus has just not evolved to be able to handle desiccation, drying out. So Thamelus has evolved to tolerate dry conditions. Balanus cannot tolerate dry conditions. And so his upper limit's set by the physical environment, meaning the tides. And so we can say that Thamelus actually has a nice evolutionary strategy by being able to tolerate that drying and therefore live in the top zone because that's his refuge from competition. He can avoid competition um, with Balanus by being able to tolerate areas that Balanus cannot. How cool is that? So that's what we call a simple yet elegant experiment in ecology. Uses the scientific method, tests a hypothesis beautifully, but not a lot of fancy equipment and money needed to do the experiment. So even you can go out and do your own ecological experiments. Well, who was the first to study competition in nature? Um, well, we give credit to a man named Gauss. George Gauss, and this was in the 1930s. So this is quite a long time ago. And this guy actually studied little, cute, single-celled protists called paramecium. Um, and uh, most of you have probably seen paramecium. And uh, it turns out there's different species of paramecium. And so he would study these guys, and he noticed something very interesting, that he'd grow these guys in petri dishes with um, yeast as their food, 
And there's two species he was looking at for this particular experiment. A little guy, we'll call him Paramecium aurelia or P. aurelia, and a large guy. Um, this is Paramecium caudatum, P. caudatum. And when he just stuck these guys together in equal numbers in a petri dish, the little guy would always beat the big guy. And he's like, that is really counterintuitive. Why is the little guy out competing the big guy? Hmm. So you can draw a graph of this. Uh, so these guys don't live very long. So this is time in days. So we're looking at 24, 25 days here. And this is um, the number of paramecium in here. And uh, you have a different curve here, an S-shaped curve for each species. So um, he had a control where he grew each separately in its own petri dish. So petri dishes of P. Aurelia, petri dishes of P. caudatum, and then a mixed petri dish where he had equal numbers of each species. So this is from the perspective of the, of the little guy, P. Aurelia. When grown by himself, he grows like crazy and then comes back to his carrying capacity. Da, 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 around, you know, 200 or so. Um, if you grow him with the big guy, P. caudatum, he still survives. He doesn't go extinct, but notice that his carrying capacity has been lowered by the presence of the other species. So again, remember competition has a negative effect on both species, even if one still survives and wins. Now, from the other guy's perspective, the big guy, here's P. caudatum, when grown by himself, he does just fine, thank you very much. You know, there's his uh, carrying capacity, very similar to the carrying capacity of Aurelia grown by itself. But in mixed populations where these guys are grown together, bump, ba -dum, boom, crash and burn to extinction. So the little guy is driving the big guy extinct. Now we come up with some hypotheses. Those were our observations, but the hypothesis to answer the question of why, why is the little guy beating the big guy? Well, turns out that you would expect a big guy to be better at acquiring resources than the little guy, so there must be something else going on. It's not the ability to acquire the resources, it's something else. And so, um, you know, again, uh, they're both strong competitors, they're both competing for the same limited resource, in this case yeast, and all else being considered, the little guy always wins. Why? Well, it turns out that the little guy will only beat the big guy in cases where the scientist is not replacing the water that they're in. So he says, what would happen if I start replacing the liquid medium, the water plus yeast, every day, giving him fresh water to swim in? When he did that, the outcome of competition changed, and the big guy ended up making the little guy go extinct. Pow! Um, and so it turns out that he figured out, through the simple yet elegant experiment, that the outcome of competitions of competition depends on the environment in which the individuals are in. And so there can be multiple mechanisms for competition, and we call that competitive asymmetry. Asymmetry meaning the outcome of competition is not always going to be the same. It depends on the environmental conditions. So P. Aurelia, the little guy, wins when it pollutes the medium, so it's actually putting out a toxic waste product. That's why it was able to beat the big guy when you're not changing the water. But when you change the water, you get rid of the little guy's ability to use his toxic uh, waste for his advantage, and then the big guy ends up winning because he's better at acquiring resources. So he wins by resource competition. Cool or what? Simple yet elegant. Okay, last few things we want to touch on in this uh, overview of ecology is um, other things that community ecologists study, like community structure. Um, for example, uh, ecologists are very interested in figuring out, okay, how many species are in a particular area? Um, why do you see more species in this area than that area? What about the community structure or the environment um, allows some species to be more common in some areas and not others? And, um, you know, how does the size of an area affect the species richness, affect the number of species in an area? So again, Species richness is defined as the number of species in an area, so how many rabbits are in an area, how many cats are in an area, etc. And many, many classical ecologists have studied that. They've also studied this on islands, like they found, um, this is called the theory of island biogeography, that large islands tend to hold a greater diversity of species than small islands and greater numbers of individuals of each species than smaller areas. So um, you can draw a graph here. 
um, for what's called the species area relationship, that your species richness, your number of species, goes up as the land area increases. So, and that's a direct correlation. So you get more and more species able to exist on an area when the area is larger. This presumably is because larger areas are going to have more niches that different species can use. And so there's less competition among species and therefore they can coexist better. Because remember to coexist, you need uh, to not be after the same shared resource. You need to use different resources. Well, what does this species area relationship translate to for practical purposes? It means if you're going to conserve an area, if you're going to try to, try to conserve as much biodiversity as possible, you need as large a habitat as possible. You need to conserve land. The more land you conserve, the more biodiversity you conserve because species richness goes up, and that's another term for species diversity, species richness goes up as your land area increases. So you want to conserve as much habitat as possible. Now another interesting phenomenon with regards to community structure is species abundance. So you may not be interested in just how many species are out there, but how many individuals of each species are out there and how even is that distribution? Do you have, you know, a thousand rabbits of this species and a thousand rabbits of this species and a thousand elephants of the species? Are they evenly spread or is there a difference in species abundance? Maybe you have a million individuals of this rabbit species and only a thousand of this one and a hundred of this one. So there could be differences in species abundance. So, and this could depend on the area. Some areas might have the same number of species. Let's say we found three species on this island and you might have found three species on another island, but maybe on the other island they're equally spread in terms of number of individuals, whereas on another one there's a difference in abundance. So we look at, you know, most common versus most rare species. So here's your number of species, your species richness, and on this time on the graph we're looking at frequency, how often you encounter that species. So for example, if you take a walk through a rainforest, you might find a certain species of insects and then you keep uh, walking along and you find another species, but you're only finding a couple individuals of each species, but lots of different species. Whereas if you go somewhere like um, a, a prairie or just a plain old grass field, there's not a lot of diversity of plants, so you might not see very many species, but you might find lots and lots of individuals of one particular species. In other words, they're overrepresented. So the way the graph goes here, um, so lots of species are rare and few species are common. So there's a, a trade-off between how common, how many individuals of each species you have and the diversity of species in an area. So most species are rare, Few species are common. Ponder that for a minute and feel free to pause at any time. Okay, um, finally we're going to get into the topic of succession. Um, many community ecologists are very interested in the topic of succession. And succession is where you're looking at the sequence of changes initiated by some kind of disturbance. That disturbance could be a forest fire. In the case of Mount St. Helens, it's a volcano erupting. Um, it could be a whole bunch of pollution coming into a waterway. Um, all those kinds of things are disturbances. It could even be you tromping on um, through the forest. That could be create a disturbance as well. But the idea is when a major disturbance happens in an ecosystem, it sets the stage for new species to come in and for a whole different assemblage of, of species to get established. Now, generally, when you're talking about succession, you're mostly talking about plants. Um, but many ecologists will go ahead and apply that term to what animals come into an area as well. And so each time you get a new set of species coming in, we call that a successional series or a seer. Um, so uh, Mount St. Helens is a great living experiment for scientists to study succession because in 1980, pow, the mountain blew its top and it basically killed off half of um, everything that lived on, on one side of the mountain. And, um, and so scientists went in there, everything was obliv obliviated. And so scientists said, okay, let's see what happens over time. What's the first plants that will come in there? What's the second set of plants? What's the third set of plants? When do the animals get there and which kinds? And so um, lots of scientists um, are currently going up to Mount St. Helens all the time 
and studying what's growing there from year to year. So in general, um, you can divide succession into primary succession and secondary succession. So primary succession is you get the establishment of plant communities. And so here we have um, through time. So usually actually the first things that come in are on rocks where you'll see like algae come in um, and then a um, little bit different kinds of algae after that. And then the mosses come in and the lichens. And after that, you'll start getting some annual plants and perennial plants and grasses and shrubs. And eventually you get tall trees given enough time. So primary succession, you get the initial small things coming in, the algae and the mosses and the small plants. And secondary succession, you're into the larger and larger plants. Now, traditionally, uh, scientists studying succession would recognize what's called a climax community. Um, that means that the ultimate assemblage of species that would come in, meaning, okay, enough time has gone on that you've reached the pinnacle of diversity in that area. Well, nowadays, they don't like that term. And so most scientists now do not use the term climax community because we understand that um, there's no such thing as an ultimate association of species. That um, species compositions, communities are constantly changing, new disturbances come in, new evolutionary pressures, new competitive interactions, and so you never have a climax community. There's no such thing. Everything is constantly changing. So, but again, the trend through succession is that plant size tends to increase over time, uh, the diversity of species tends to increase, and perhaps then due to com competition and things like that decreases. Um, over time, productivity decreases because you're getting, um, uh, as you get larger species, there's less energy or ecological efficiency going on. And uh, you increase the efficiency of nutrient cycling. So in the next lecture, we'll be learning about biogeochemical cycles or nutrient cycles. In other words, how carbon and nitrogen and phosphorus and things like that are broken down and cycled through the environment. And by the way, here's a picture of the site of Mount St. Helens. Pretty cool. So um, again, just to recap, primary succession is the gradual establishment of biotic communities in areas where no life existed before, so right after a disturbance. Um, and so uh, you get this on newly forming islands like Hawaii. Um, and so early on you get, so here's your rocks, no, no life there, but initially you get your lichens and your mosses and your algae going right on the bare rock, and then you get your mosses and your small herbs and shrubs and then small trees and eventually your very large trees. Um, and secondary succession is um, often in, um, sometimes called old field succession. This is where, okay, the little guys are established and now we're getting bigger and bigger things, your weeds, your shrubs. Um, larger and larger and larger trees until you have these mature forests, like the old redwood forest, for example. Um, and so again, just, just to recap, climax community, it's still written into textbooks, but ecologists do not like the term climax community because succession is influenced by variability and chaotic events such that there is no single climax. Okay, and final word. So we mentioned that succession can be triggered by disturbance events like forests or pollutants or human activities of other kinds. But disturbance isn't always a bad thing because when you have disturbance, it, it initiates that succession and it can allow for new niches to open up, new evolution to open up, and that allows for greater biodiversity, changeover of species. So in fact, um, one of the things that happened in the course of the United States history is the Forest Service used to suppress forest fires. They did not want any fire happening in the forest at all. And so if littlest fire came along, they put it out. Well, what ended up happening is because they were suppressing the natural tendency of forest fires to happen, um, tree species and other species fungi and things like that were getting overabundant and the trees were increasing competition with each other for shared resources like water and nutrients and as they increased the competition they became weaker and weaker um, they couldn't get the nutrients and the water that they needed to have high immunity and so many of them would succumb to things like bark beetles and other pests and they would die and became firewood kablooey right all that fuel all that firewood everywhere cause not the normal size natural fires, but 
big mega fires that caused all sorts of problems for humans as well and they had a big problem on their hand but they found that areas where fires were not suppressed and the natural order of things was allowed to take place they actually ended up having healthier forests because um, you would end up having old trees die and leave room for new trees to come about. Um, fires would actually stimulate the growth of the seed bank that was in the soil, so you'd get new new plants being uh, regenerated. And and so um, in general, disturbance, when on a natural scale, can be a good thing for biodiversity. When it's on a not a natural scale, like in the case of anthropogenic causes, human cause activities. Um, then it can be a very, very bad thing because when you get habitat degradation, you also get all the other problems associated with it. So the ultimate disturbance that's happening now, global climate change. And we really do not know what the effects of that disturbance are going to be. We um, can predict what some of the effects of these are of, of climate change is. We can look in past climate change history and see what the effects have been. Um, in general, too much climate change, you tend to get a major, you get a mass extinction. You get um, loss of a lot of biodiversity. Now, again, what's causing this climate change? Um, in general, we believe that human activities are at least contributing to it, if not being the primary cause. However, um, climate change is natural. It's happened many, many times um, throughout the history of life on Earth. And so either way, no matter what the cause is, it's interesting to look at what the effects will be. All right, that's it for our overview of ecology. We're, uh, next lecture, we're going to talk about conservation issues and biomes and biogeochemical cycles. Till then.